So let's think about how we're going to add functionality to Bitcoin, in particular the transactions itself. So what we want to do is we want to do um, more complicated things than simply move money from one address to another address. And so in order to understand uh, what Bitcoin can do and also how to extend uh, sort of the boundaries past what Bitcoin can do into things that Ethereum can do, we first have to look at actually exactly what is it that Bitcoin's doing. And so Bitcoin uh, is a little more complicated probably than you realize up to this point uh, based on the lecture material anyways. Okay, so let's look at a transaction. Um, so here's a transaction, a historically important transaction as it was the first, first transaction actually in, in Bitcoin's history where Satoshi Nakamoto sent uh, 10 Bitcoin to an, another computer scientist, uh, Hal Finney. Uh, and then 40 went back to Satoshi as change. And uh, anyway, so, so we looked at the transaction structure uh, before. That's something that we've already seen. Uh, but one thing that we didn't look at, or I might have mentioned it in passing, is there's these things called uh, scripts. So there's this input script and output script. And it turns out that these scripts are really important to understanding the functionality of Bitcoin. So what's a script? What does it mean? What, what, let's, let's think about this, okay? So what's happening in this transaction is, let's draw it out. So we have this transaction, okay? And uh, this transaction has some ID. I won't copy it because it's too long to fit into a nice diagram. Uh, and if we look at it, we can see that it has, um, it has one input uh, to the transaction and it has two outputs to the transaction. Okay, um, so we have an input. And then we have output one and output two. Okay, now this input is a pointer to an, a previous unspent transaction. Okay, so there's some transaction from Bitcoin's history it's not necessarily right before it, it could, you know, go back, you know, you have no idea where it is. All you know is it was sometime in the past, okay? And that transaction, we don't know anything else about it. It could have had any number of inputs, any number of outputs, but one of their outputs, call it output I, uh, is uh, this input. So this input is saying, uh, or what this transaction is saying is, hey, there's this output way back if you go back into block with this id and if you look through the outputs you'll see that it's the third output on the list of outputs i want to spend that okay and so the miners will of course make sure that this output has not been spent yet so they'll ask ourselves uh, is this a utxo and we'll assume that the answer is yes uh, so this is an output that's already sitting in their utxo pools okay and so the question is what is it that that allows this uh, transaction to spend that UTXO. Uh, so the rule that we said is something like this. Um, this was output to a key and uh, this transaction needs to be signed by the same key that this was output to. Okay, so this output, if you zoom in, you'll see that uh, there's a key that it's given to, a receiver's key. So I'll say recipients. Okay, uh, let's just call it K. And then this whole transaction needs to be signed by K, where percent just means everything that's above it. Um, okay, great. Okay, so now the question is, where did these rules come from? So one answer is, well, it could be hard baked into the Bitcoin protocol, okay? So every output is to a key and the signature has to have be signed by the same key. The keys have to match. In other words, the signature has a public key. This is the secret key that was used in the signature algorithm, but the secret key belongs to a certain public key, and that public key needs to be specified here, or maybe a hash of the public key, which is the Bitcoin address, is specified here, okay? Now, it turns out that Bitcoin is actually a little more general than that. Uh, so everything I just said is true, and the reason it's true is because the person who created this transaction actually specified that as the rule, okay? What they did is they actually wrote a little bit of code uh, that specifies how you're allowed to output, or how you're allowed to spend this output, 
Okay, so the reality of the situation is that every output comes with uh, a piece of code. Okay, so it has a script, we call it, and it basically says who's allowed to spend. And every input, uh, so the input up here, it also comes with a script. Okay, so there's going to be a script here. And this script is going to be the evidence, it's going to be some evidence that suggests that they're, they're, they match the description of the person who's allowed to spend it. Okay, uh, so this is evidence they are allowed to spend. Okay, so if you want to think about like a check, right? A check, you would write the name of the person who can cash the check. And then when the person walks into the bank with the check, they show their ID to the teller. Uh, so the, the check itself, the two line on a check is this, that's the output script. And then the evidence that uh, is being given to the teller, uh, that's the input script that's associated here, okay? Um, Okay, now it turns out that, that Bitcoin clients do this automatically. So you don't have to sit there and type in the script that's going to spend it in this certain way. Uh, your client will just automatically uh, do what's called a standard transaction. And it turns out that if you look at Bitcoin transactions, even though there is this general scripting languages and you could write it up different ways, uh, the vast majority of Bitcoin transactions all use the exact same script, okay? It's so common that people just call it the standard transaction. Okay, so you have a, a standard transaction. It looks kind of the same way. There have been some variations as Bitcoin has changed uh, over the past. So I'll show you what a standard transaction looked like at the time of, of this, um, at the time that this transaction took place, which was, was near the start of Bitcoin. Um, and yeah, adjustments to the scripting languages are happening. It's also under debate. People sometimes want to add new uh, capabilities to the scripting language. Uh, but anyways, we'll, we'll get into the politics of it a little bit more when we introduce Ethereum. But let's, let's just understand what's going on here, okay? So what we have is every output has a script that describes who's allowed to spend it. And every input has a script that, that provides the evidence that they're allowed to, to spend it, okay? So we're gonna use the terminology output script for the scripts that are tagged to an output and the scripts that are tagged to an input, we'll call an input script. And note that even if you're not allowed to spend this, there's nothing stopping you from creating a transaction and you know, trying to spend it. You can still create a transaction, point at this output and say, hey, I'm allowed to spend it, okay? But what's gonna happen is uh, all the miners are gonna look at these rules and they're gonna look at your evidence and they should all conclude, oh, you're not actually allowed uh, to spend that particular output. Okay, that will be, um, so this is one of the tasks that miners do uh, is when they look at transactions and usually they look at it even before it ends up in a block, even before they put it in their, uh, their mempool, uh, they'll do a quick check on it to make sure that, that the input script satisfies the conditions that are specified in the output script. Okay, and so how many scripts are in this transaction? Well this input has an input script that's being matched to this output script because this is the UTXO that, that's uh, trying to be spent, okay? Uh, I'll just underline you here to, to put the emphasis on unspent uh, transaction. Um, this is a TXO regardless, it just might be a spent one or an unspent one. And all of these outputs, once you take a bunch of money in, so we take 50 Bitcoin in, in this case, and we give 10, uh, so 50 comes in, and in this case 10 is going to one person and 40 is going to another person, these will also have their own output scripts. Okay, so there'll be a new output script. Okay, that specifies how these outputs are then allowed to be spent. And this output script doesn't have to be the same as this one, okay? So if you ever wanna change the script, uh, you can sort of, if, if you're able to satisfy the conditions of it, you can kind of send the money to yourself and then uh, have a different script on the output here, okay? It also means that if we're looking at this input script and we're trying to see uh, the output script that, that it's going to be matched, we're not going to find it in the same transaction. We have to go back to find the output script here, okay? So it's easy to get confused. Uh, let me show you 
on Block Explorer. So we have this input script here. Uh, so that's for this input of 50 bitcoins here. And this input script isn't satisfying these output scripts. Okay, it's satisfying the input script of the output script when this transaction was created. So this 50 Bitcoin came from this transaction. So we have to go back to this older transaction. Uh, so this actually bumped us back to the block, uh, not the, tr the transaction itself, but, um, or sorry, I guess it bumped us to the address. Uh, here, let's try this instead. Okay, uh, so we can go back to the, the to where this 50 Bitcoins came from. Uh, so it was came from this transaction. This happens to be a Coinbase transaction, so there was no new inputs. That also explains why it was 50, because back then the block reward was 50. Um, and it has an output script here. Okay, so this output script of the previous transaction is what's being linked to the input script of this new transaction. Okay, what do these scripts look like, and how do we evaluate them and make sure that uh, we sat that the input script satisfies the output script? So I mentioned that most output scripts look exactly the same. They follow a, a kind of standard uh, script. Um, so a common output script is called pay to public key hash. And uh, this is sometimes abbreviated pay to public key hash. And uh, okay, so this is the output script that will specify this input. It also happens because this is just mapping standard transactions. These will be standard transactions as well. So it's also the same output script here. And what Bitcoin does is it actually has a scripting language. It looks kind of like assembly, uh, if you think about what code looks like. So it looks like assembly code uh, where you have op codes. Um, so they're really small primitive operations that do sort of basic things. Um, and they don't say what inputs or outputs there are. It's just by convention that you have to look up that op code and you have to see uh, what the inputs and the outputs of them are, okay? Um, so here's what a, a, a pay to public key hash output script looks like. So if you want the person uh, to, oh, sorry, output script. So if you want to specify the hash of, uh, so the hash of the public key is, is really the Bitcoin address. So if you want to write into your Bitcoin uh, transaction, just the Bitcoin address of the person who can spend it, you're going to use this output script. Okay, and these uh, the the script itself won't make any sense to you because it's Bitcoin's own internal language. Uh, but we'll talk about I'll, I'll give you one example of, of how it's evaluated. Um, so there's a series of operations. Uh, so the first one's called operation duplicate. Uh, the next one's called hash 160. This will take a um, ripe MD 160 hash of something to be specified. Um, we have public key hash. And uh, the notation I'm using here is this is data. So anything that starts with op underscores an operation, and then you can also write data as well. Uh, so that, that's a piece of data. Uh, op equal verify and op check sig. Okay, so this is the little script. Uh, you can see it's four operations, one piece of data, uh, and, and, and that's it, okay? Um, and then if you wanna spend this, uh, you'll write, you'll come along with your evidence uh, that, that you're the right person that can spend this. And uh, your evidence will look like this, and then we'll, we'll talk about what it actually means and we'll actually evaluate it. Uh, but basically what you're gonna do is you're gonna say, um, hey, this transaction, I signed it. Uh, here's the data of that signature. Okay, and here's my public key. Okay, so you say, 
uh, I signed this transaction, here's the signature, and I signed it with a certain public key. So here's the public key, okay? And where you can see this going is uh, what you want to check is that if you, first off, you want to check that this signature is actually valid, okay? So that's sort of what CheckSig is going to do. It's actually a valid signature on this transaction. Uh, you want to see that this public key was used in this signature, okay? Um, and you also want to see that this public key, if you hash it, is the same as the public key that's uh, in the output script that's specified here, okay? Uh, so that's that's all these scripts are going to do. It's going to do those operations in a particular order, okay? So what does a miner do? So a miner comes along and they see this transaction. It's a pending transaction, and they're wondering, should I add it to my mempool or not? So they'll pull this input script out. It looks like this. Uh, they'll go back to this output script. They'll check that, yeah, it's in my UTXO pool. Uh, I have the output here. Here's the script itself. It looks like this. Now I want to evaluate it. I want to know, does this satisfy this or not? Okay. And so what we're going to do is, um, this is the validation procedure, is we're going to take uh, the input script and we're going to concatenate it to the start of the output script. Okay, so we're going to uh, put it first. And then we're going to take that, so that's sort of our combined code, and then we're going to execute it. And hopefully at the end of executing it, uh, we'll be left with a Boolean, uh, which will say either true or false. Uh, so the output of, of execution will be true or false. And if the output is true, then we say it's a valid transaction, or at least it's a valid, um, it's a valid input for this transaction. Okay, so this, this input was at least valid. It's allowed to spend this output. It doesn't mean all the other inputs are, but if we do this process for all of the inputs, uh, then we'll say that the whole transaction is valid, okay? And notice that um, that if, if there's multiple inputs here, let's say there's three or four inputs, they'll all have their own script. Okay, so they'll all have their own language. Um, and because the signatures inside these inputs, they're all signing for uh, the, the various outputs. And so all the outputs could be to totally different Bitcoin addresses. And as long as you can bring signatures from each of those dif different Bitcoin addresses into the same transaction, then you're allowed to spend all that money in the context of a single transaction. Uh, if, if all that flew over your head, that's fine. Okay, so now I'll just show you, I'll show you how this script works. Uh, I don't expect you to, to memorize all the details of, of Bitcoin and Bitcoin scripts. Uh, it's, it's interesting, it's something you could look at in the course of a project or something like that. Um, if you want to, to really get into the, the details of this. But anyways, so when we do this concatenation, we basically have this uh, as our as our code, okay? So we're going to read this as lines of code from top to bottom, okay? So we're going to process it this way, okay? And the the way that we do it is uh, we're going to use what's called a stack. Uh, so stack is a data structure where it's last in, first out, okay? Uh, so what we're going to do is when we see data, uh, we're going to push it onto the stack. And when we see an operation, we're going to execute it on the data that's sitting on the stack. Okay, so uh, let me just make sure that I have enough space here. Just move this over a bit. Okay, so what we do is uh, we take, say, its data, so we're going to put it at, uh, we'll say this is the bottom of our stack. So we have our signature sitting here. Okay, so we're done with this, so we remove it. Then we have the public key, we're going to move that onto the stack. I'll just put PK for short. So that's now on our stack, okay? The next thing we're going to do is we're going to run op dupe, okay? So op dupe is a specific operation. Uh, what it does is it makes a duplicate of whatever city on the stack. It takes one, it takes one input and the output is a copy of that input. So the thing at the top of the stack is PK. So it's going to take PK as input and the output will be a copy of PK. So we're going to end up with two PKs on the stack, okay? The next thing is op 
160, hash 160. What this is going to do is it's also going to take one input. So the, it's going to take uh, the thing that's on the top of our stack uh, as input, and it's going to replace it with a hash of this value. So instead of having a public key here, what we're going to do is we're going to get uh, a hash of the public key. So I'll just sort of dynamically update this. Um, so now we have a hash. Uh, so ripeMD in this case, a PK. And specifically, it's the kind of hash that's going to turn this key into a Bitcoin address. Okay. Next thing we do is we have the public key hash. And so notice just, just we might as well kind of pay attention to what's going on as, as we go through the details as well. Um, notice that this public key came from the input. Okay, so this was the public key uh, from the input. Now we have a hash of it, so we turned it into a Bitcoin address. And now we have the public key from the output. So the output saying, this is the public key that can spend it. And the thing that's sitting here is the public key that is trying to spend it. At least hopefully that's the case. Okay, so we're gonna try and see whether these things match. Uh, but anyways, we're gonna move pub key hash onto here. Okay, and so now we're done with that. Now we're gonna run an operation called equal verify. Okay. What equal verify will do is it will take two inputs. Um, so it takes two inputs. And uh, what it's going to do is it's going to basically check whether these two things are the same. And it's also going to check that they're valid uh, Bitcoin addresses. Okay. Uh, and what it will do is um, if they're the same, uh, then it will just consume them and remove them from the stack. Okay, and uh, if they're not the same, uh, then what it will do is it will return false. Okay, and it, when, once it returns false, uh, we're done. Okay, uh, so what we'll do is let's assume that these are actually the same. Uh, then if they are the same, uh, then that's fine. Uh, we'll consume them, so we'll move them off the stack. And uh, you can think of it as implicitly you, you sort of write true, uh, but if, if you don't write true in, then, uh, then you just abort. Okay, so, so in other words, the, the output of this is do not abort, keep going, uh, everything's good. Okay, so the last thing that we're left with is uh, the public key and the signature, and check sig uh, is a function that will take two inputs. Uh, basically a public key and a signature, and it's going to check that this signature was actually, uh, the, the key that was used to sign this belongs to this public key, okay? And if that's true, and it's going to check that signature over something, uh, it's going to check it over the transaction itself, okay? So it's going to check that um, this is about signature on this transaction, and furthermore, it used this public key, the specified public key, okay? So there wasn't, we didn't switch keys. We didn't sign with one key and then specify a different key. It's the same key that's uh, being used by both, okay? And check sig will consume both of these and then once again, it will return either a true or a false. Uh, so we'll assume that in this case it worked. So it's gonna return true. Uh, and then this will be a valid transaction. Okay, uh, and so what's really nice about this is um, because we duplicated the key, uh, that's the thing that ensures that, that the same key that we're checking against the public key hash is the key that was used in the signature. Uh, so this duplication is, is sort of what binds those two things together. Um, so basically we have a transaction and it has some signature on it and that signature was supposed to come from a public key. And we also have some previous transaction and the output of this transaction is an input to this transaction. Uh, it's also specified to be paid to a public key, and we want to make sure that both of these public keys are exactly the same, that they both match. Um, so that's what this script, uh, what it executes. When it executes, this is what it verifies, okay? So anyways, this is the details of how Bitcoin works, and there's two consequences to doing this deep dive. Even if you're not really into the scripting, it's, it's a little bit confusing. Um, let's think about what are the takeaways? Okay, so the first takeaway is that Bitcoin can do more complicated things than a standard transaction. 
Um, how much more can it do? Well, the designer of Bitcoin was very concerned that people would write scripts that were so complicated uh, that they would um, that they would take miners a long time to solve to see whether it's actually true or not. And then that would work as a kind of denial of service attack on, on Bitcoin. And notice that if this is a, a short script or a long script, um, it, it's true that because fees, I guess, are, are a floating rate, miners might charge more for a longer script. But there's no inherent... Uh, mechanism where a script that, that takes longer to execute is, is more expensive than a script that doesn't. Uh, miners generally consider things in terms of data size, so uh, a script that long, takes longer to execute would generally be longer also in terms of data. Um, but miners don't know until they start executing what that script actually looks like or how much time it's going to take. Okay, So they've at least executed it once before they realize, oh, that actually took a really long time uh, to, to come up with this output, and, the, and the, by that time it's too late. Um, so it doesn't really matter what the fee is. Um, so anyway, so uh, just that's just a really complicated thing to say that uh, what Bitcoin does is they keep it really, really limited. Okay, so they have a very limited, I'll put the emphasis on very, uh, very limited language to counter uh, denial of service attacks. And every now and then they add new languages and it turns out that, that there's a way of adding, or sorry, add new operations. You can add new operations without um, necessarily resulting in uh, what's called a hard fork where everyone has to update uh, their clients. Um, so th there's ways to sort of sneak uh, new operations in, but they're, they tend to be very conservative about adding functionality. Okay, so there were some people who took a look at uh, this sort of situation and they said, um, we, you know, this, it's great that Bitcoin does it this way, uh, but we would like to take a completely different philosophy. We think that we should have a cryptocurrency that's very liberal in terms of its scripting, and we should add as much functionality as we can uh, to it. And there is a level of functionality that you can add where once you have that level of functionality, you can sort of, anything that you can compute, you have enough operations that you could compute anything that you would want to compute. Uh, so this is called Turing completeness. There's a lot of red tape around a, a simple question like whether one of these, these new cryptocurrencies that, that offer more functionality is Turing complete. There's, there's more to the question than uh, is the set of operations uh, sufficient to compute anything. But, um, Anyway, so the point is that there, there, were, there was another team of people who thought we should be uh, a lot different. Uh, so we should be more liberal. We should try and give people as much functionality as possible. Uh, if there's now service attacks, whatever, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with them as they come up and we'll make tweaks. And eventually the protocol will kind of evolve into something um, where there won't be denial of service attacks. And what we'll also do is we'll tweak the economics. So what you'll do is uh, you'll actually pay uh, you'll pay a fee that's contingent on how complicated it is to operate or to run your script. Okay, so uh, we'll give you a lot more flexibility and freedom to write very verbose scripts, uh, but we're going to charge you for every operation and we'll have a kind of set fee uh, for, for every operation that you want to do uh, and, th and that's going to be the cost. Okay, um, so anyways, a system that took this approach uh, is called Ethereum. Uh, and so that's going to be the main kind of topic for the middle of this course. And then at the end of the course, we'll talk about some of the things you could run on top of uh, either Bitcoin or mostly Ethereum uh, that, that would work in the financial space. Um, OK, uh, so, so uh, there's one other thing that I want to talk about, which is before we jump into Ethereum is um, we saw this as a standard transaction and we know that Bitcoin is very limited. Um, and so what is it that Bitcoin can actually do? Okay, uh, so what more can Bitcoin do? Do we have to jump right to Ethereum or, or can we try and, and get more out of Bitcoin? Um, so there's a couple of things that Bitcoin can do that um, 
that are, are kind of operations that are, are not as standard as your standard operation, but you still see them a fair bit. Um, so I'll give you a couple of examples. So one of them is called multisig. And so multisig, what you do is you send, uh, so a UTXO uh, can be spent if uh, the input is signed by at least m out of n specified keys. So you'll say, here's 10 keys, uh, and here's a number m, like four, uh, and if at least four of these keys sign this input, then go ahead and spend it. And so multisig can allow different types of things, like, for example, let's say you have an escrow service where Alice is gonna send some money to Bob, and Bob's supposed to send back uh, some goods, like say through the mail. And Alice is concerned that if she moves the money to Bob, that, that he won't send the goods. And Bob has the opposite concern that if he sends the goods, Alice won't pay him. And so one of them has to go first. Uh, so the idea here is that what Alice could do is she can move the money um, to a kind of third party. Uh, and if Alice and the third party agree to send the money back to Alice, then they can move that money. And if the third party and Bob agree to send the money to Bob, then the money moves to Bob. And if Alice and Bob both agree uh, that, that Bob should get paid, then the money moves to Bob. Okay, so basically you have three parties, all three of their keys would be specified, and you would write a policy that says basically two of the three uh, can move the money. And then if there's a dispute where Bob wants to get paid and Alice doesn't want to pay, they both go to the third party, and we don't know how the third party is going to adjudicate this. Uh, but somehow they mediate a solution to it and then they uh, can work with the person who will get paid in order to actually move the money. Um, so that, that's just a, a very simple example that uses two out of three uh, multi-sig. Um, so I'll just write that as an example, e.g. two out of three. And m doesn't have to be strictly less than n, so you could have three out of three. Uh, so maybe for backup reasons, or you're really worried that your key is going to get stolen, and so you want to have everything in two out of two transactions where you have one key that you keep on a USB stick and another key that you keep somewhere else. Everything has to be signed by both of these keys. Uh, you can do that. The problem with it is actually it's actually worse for backups because if you lose either one of these keys, even if you still have the other one, then you can't move your money. Um, but anyways, okay, so that's multisig. Uh, another thing we can do uh, that's somewhat common is called a hash lock. Uh, so with a hash lock, what happens is uh, the output script will have the hash of some value x, and the input script will have to cough up that actual value of, of x. And we know from hash functions that hash functions are one way. Okay, so if you look at h of x, if you're looking at the output script saying, hey, I want to spend that, uh, there's no way that you can computationally compute the x that you would need to spend it. Okay, now you might say, oh, that's awesome, we can get rid of signatures altogether, right? Well, if Alice wants to pay Bob, then Alice will move money in, she'll pick a random X, she'll move money to H of X, and then she'll tell Bob what X is. And then Bob will go and show up. But the problem with this is, as soon as Bob broadcasts the transaction that includes X, everyone else can look at, they also know that X value. And if the only thing, if knowing this value X is the only thing that allows you to spend this output, then a miner or a node on the network, they could create a transaction uh, that tries to spend it as well. And they'll, they'll, like for example, let's say the very first node that hears about your transaction, they just forget that they heard about your transaction. They take your X out of, their, out of your transaction and they put it in a transaction that pays them, okay? Um, so hash locks you can't use by themselves, okay? Uh, so they always have to be composed with a signature. But what you can do is you can have it kind of like a two out of two signature where you say, if you want to spend it, you have to sign it and you also have to have this X value as well. Uh, so it's a sort of additional uh, kind of check. <coughs> okay, so this is this uh, augments 
a signature. Uh, and you can't use by itself. And that uh, idea that other miners will, will sort of take your value of x out and put it in their own transactions we sometimes call front running. So there's front running attacks. If you if you just use this by itself as a mechanism. Okay, another common operation is something called op return. And so it turned out that um, because Bitcoin Bitcoin's blockchain is sort of this immutable, it has some time stamping and things like that. People thought it would be cool if you could just submit arbitrary data. Like say you had a document and you wanted to prove that it was um, no uh, newer than a particular date. Uh, then what you could do is you could uh, sort of submit it, maybe a hash of it uh, into Bitcoin's blockchain. And then you can have Bitcoin uh, not just timestamp it, but actually build proof of work onto the end of that value, uh, which would be compelling evidence that that you know, it took some amount of time to, to create that proof of work. And so it must be kind of old. Um, so this idea of using Bitcoin to timestamp or to use it as a kind of tamper proof immutable log uh, was an idea that lots of people had and they wanted to do. And uh, Bitcoin originally didn't have a capability of inserting arbitrary data into it. And so people did all sorts of things to sort of uh, to try and do it. Like, for example, they would send, instead of sending money to a Bitcoin address, they would send it to the hash of the document, uh, which would get the hash of the document into the blockchain, but it would also burn that Bitcoin. You could never spend it. It would say a UTXO forever. It would still be in people's UTXO pools today. Um, so what Bitcoin eventually said is, there's enough demand for this, enough people are doing it, and we don't want, uh, it's sort of bad manners to kind of pollute the UTXO pool by sending things uh, using hashes of, of information or information itself in the addresses. Uh, we're going to give people a way that they can pay a little bit of money, they can pay a little fee, and then they can, uh, we'll host some arbitrary data for them. Okay. And so this is used a lot for uh, different systems that build on top of Bitcoin. So if you don't want to, um, if you don't want to create your own altcoin, you want to write some values into Bitcoin. This is sometimes called a sidechain. Uh, this is the mechanism. For you, okay. Uh, so at the time that I'm creating this lecture, uh, op return uh, it doesn't let you store a lot of data, but it gives you 80 bytes uh, of data. Uh, op return has an input, uh, but no output. Uh, so there's no UTXO. And uh, the input in this case is just the fee. And I forgot to look up what the current op return fee is. It's, it's not uh, a prohibitive about money. Okay, um, so, so this is another kind of non-standard uh, transaction uh, that, that people use uh, that's, that's used uh, quite a bit. Okay, now there's some other ones that, that uh, you know, if we had infinite time, uh, I would talk about like pay to script hash and there's a few other important ones, but I'm um, just going to end it here, and when we come back, we'll, we'll talk about uh, Ethereum and what Ethereum adds uh, to the small set of limited functionality that Bitcoin has. Okay, I'm back for just one quick second to add uh, one other operation. Um, so it's not ex exactly specified like this. It turns out there's actually a bunch of different ways of doing this, but I just want to give you the general concept, uh, which is this idea of a time lock. Uh, so a time lock says that transactions, uh, you have to wait a certain amount of time or a certain number of blocks before you can spend it. Okay, so it's uh, unspendable until after uh, a period of time. And uh, so typically it would be in terms of blocks. Uh, you can try and use wall clock time, but it's going to end up being in terms of blocks anyway. Um, and so, uh, or, or at least it, or it will be based on uh, sort of timestamps, uh, which are a little fuzzy. And so anyways, uh, you can sort of extrapolate out, uh, you know, blocks are going to come every 10 minutes on average. And so you can uh, sort of fuzzily uh, specify a time lock. 
Um, but, but anyways, this is going to be useful uh, later on uh, when we talk about financial applications. We'll, we'll hopefully have time to talk about uh, micropayments or offline payments, uh, and time lock is an important component. So I just wanted to make sure that we, we covered that as well. Okay, so now I'll, I'll really go and we'll talk about Ethereum next time.